The Ten Inexhaustible Treasuries, Chapter Twenty Two. Sutra: The Ten Inexhaustible Treasuries, Chapter Twenty Two. Commentary: In the Flower Adornment Sutra, every Dharma Door is explained in ten ways. Each of the ten ways further divides into ten aspects, making a hundred parts. Each of the hundred parts again divides into ten, making a thousand kinds. Dividing each of those kinds into ten gives ten thousand. In other words, the meanings and principles in the Flower Adornment Sutra are multi-layered and inexhaustible, inexhaustible and multi-layered. These principles can be spoken to the end of future compass and still not be finished. So the title of this chapter reads: "The Ten Inexhaustible Treasuries." Treasuries refers to the unending dharmas contained herein. This is Chapter Twenty Two of the Flower Adornment Sutra. Sutra at that time, forest of merit and virtual bodhisattva further told. All the bodhisattvas, disciples of the Buddha, bodhisattva mahasattvas have ten kinds of treasuries, which all the Buddhas of the past have spoken about, all the Buddhas of the future will speak about, and all the Buddhas of the present are speaking about. Commentary at the time of speaking the ten inexhaustible treasuries chapter. At that time, forest of merit and virtual bodhisattva further told all the bodhisattvas, disciples of the Buddha, bodhisattva mahasattvas have ten kinds of treasuries. As a great bodhisattva among bodhisattvas has ten kinds of dharma treasuries which he should cultivate. There are those which all the Buddhas of the past have spoken about. All the Buddhas of the future will speak about, and all the Buddhas of the present are speaking about. All the Buddhas of the past have already espoused them. All the Buddhas of the future will espoused them, and all the Buddhas of the present are espousing them right now. Right now, they are speaking about the ten treasuries, Dharma Door, and teaching and transforming living beings. Sutra. What are the ten? They are the treasury of belief, the treasury of precepts, the treasury of shame, the treasury of remorse, the treasury of learning, the treasury of giving, the treasury of wisdom, the treasury of mindfulness, the treasury of upholding, and the treasury of eloquence. Those are the ten. Commentary. What are the ten dharma treasuries? They are as follows. The treasury of belief, the treasury of precepts, the treasury of shame, the treasury of remorse, the treasury of learning, the treasury of giving, the treasury of wisdom, the treasury of mindfulness, the treasury of upholding, and the treasury of eloquence. At present, I just name the ten dharma treasuries, and then afterwards I speak about them in detail. Those are the ten dharma treasury dharma doors. From out of these ten dharma treasuries come all the Buddhas of the past, future, and present. These are ten dharma treasuries are their mother. Sutra, disciples of the Buddha. What is the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's treasury of belief? Commentary. Each of you disciples of the Buddha ought to pay attention because now I am going to explain them for you in detail. For rest of merit and virtual bodhisattva concerned that the bodhisattvas wouldn't pay attention, compassionately calls out again to all the disciples of the Buddha. He says, "Disciples of the Buddha." He isn't afraid of the trouble of repeating himself. He is concerned that there are bodhisattvas there who have entered samadhi or have fallen asleep, or who are almost asleep. But not quite, so they aren't able to hear the dharma he is speaking. So he again says, "Disciples of the Buddha, you ought to strike up your spirits and not be so lazy. I'm going to talk about this dharma door of the ten inexhaustible treasuries. What is the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's treasury of belief? I'm going to tell you now." Sutra. These Bodhisattvas believe that all dharmas are empty. 
They believe that all dhammas are without an appearance. They believe that all dhammas are wishless. They believe that all dhammas are without creation. They believe that all dhammas are without distinctions. They believe that all dhammas are without reliance. They believe that all dhammas are not able to be measured. They believe that all dhammas are unsurpassed. They believe that all dhammas are difficult to transcend. They believe that all dhammas are without production. Commentary: These great bodhisattvas or monk bodhisattvas believe that all dhammas are empty. All dhammas are void. They are still and extinct, as it is said. Sweep away all dhammas and separate from all marks. They believe that all dhammas are without a mark. They truly believe that all dhammas are empty, and since dhammas are empty, they have no mark, and they are still and extinct. The still extinction of all dhammas can't be spoken about. Penetrating the basic substance of dhammas, the way of words and speech is cut off, and the place where the mind moves is extinguished. They believe that all dhammas are without an appearance. They believe that all dhammas are wishless, without motives. When you cultivate the dharma, don't be greedy. Don't say. I want to obtain such and such a benefit. I want to be such and such a way. That's false thinking. The drama is empty, markless, and wishless. There is no mark and there is no wish. They believe that all dramas are without creation. There is no marker and there is nothing made. They believe that all dhammas are without distinctions. They are unable to say, "My dharma is high and yours is low." My dharma is good and your dharma is bad. They don't harbor any discrimination. They believe that all dharmas are without reliance. All dharmas have nothing that they rely on to be created. They believe that all dharmas are not able to be measured. They are incalculable. All dharmas are empty, markless, wishless, are without creation, without distinctions, and they don't rely on anything. You also cannot measure them. You can't even count them. There are so many. One way of explaining that they are uncountable is to say there are so many of them. Another way of explaining it is to say there isn't even one. There isn't anything at all. If there is nothing, then how can you count something? If you have one, two, three, four, or maybe one foot, two feet. Three feet, five feet. You could measure them and calculate them. But if basically there isn't anything, then what can you count? To do so would be adding a head on top of your head. They believe that all dhammas are unsurpassed. You should believe that all, although all dhammas are immeasurable and empty, still there is nothing superior to these dhammas. All dhammas are extremely supreme, profound, and mysterious. They believe that all dhammas are difficult to transcend. They can't, you can't go beyond all dhammas. They believe that all dhammas are without production. Ultimately, dhammas are not produced. Sutra. If bodhisattvas can accord with all dhammas in this way, then after they give rise to pure belief, when they hear that all Buddha dhammas are inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that all Buddhas are inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that all realm of living beings is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the dharma realm is inconceivable. Their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the realm of empty space is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the realm of nirvana is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. Commentary: If bodhisattvas can accord with all dhammas in this way, if bodhisattvas contemplate that all dhammas are void, without marks or wishes, that all dhammas are not created. That all dhammas are without distinctions. That all dhammas are without reliance. That all dhammas are immeasurable. That all dhammas are unsurpassed. That all dhammas can't be transcended. That all dhammas are not produced. Then, after they give rise to pure belief, 
they will be without any attachments to Marx. When they hear that all Buddha dharmas are inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. They hear that all dharmas cannot be considered by their mind and cannot be spoken of by words. Some people who, who hear this might become very frightened and say, Oh, you can't think about it and you can't speak about it. What kind of dharma is this? Oh, I'm not going to study this. Their minds will become afraid. They retreat. They won't study, study the Buddha dharma. They won't dare even listen to it. When they hear that all Buddhas are inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When Bodhisattvas hear that all Buddhas are unthinkable and unspeakable, that they are ineffable, one, ineffably wonderful, their minds will be undaunted. The Bodhisattvas have somebody power, although they know that all Buddhas and all Dhammas are inconceivable and ineffable, their minds remain in a state of unmoving suchness, comprehending and always lucid. When they hear that the realm of living beings is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that all the realms of living beings are also inconceivable and ineffable, their minds won't retreat. They are not intimidated. When they hear that the Dharma realm is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the realm of empty space is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the realm of Nirvana is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When people hear that all afflictions can disappear and all happiness can be cut off, they say, how can I do without afflictions when I take afflictions as my meal? If you tell most ordinary people not to have any afflictions, they'd say, that's impossible. For instance, there is a lay woman who was always sick and she came here to ask me what to do. She wanted to know how she could get her sickness cured. I told her that if she didn't have any afflictions and didn't get angry, her sickness would be cured. She said, I can't do that. I can't do it. I said, if you can't do it, then your sickness won't get any better. She said, well, I'll go try. So she tried. She was patient and she bore it. But several times she couldn't take it and got angry. When she got angry, she had afflictions and her blood pressure went up. Her blood pressure was up, up, up. I don't know how hard it got and she had to go into the hospital. She was almost dying. It was so bad. Then she remembered that I told her if she had no afflictions, her sickness would get better. So she got control of her temper and put out her fire and her sickness got better. Later, she said, I'm very afraid I'm going to die when my blood pressure goes up. So I reside and request you to please come save me. I said, you're one who doesn't light in sense when everything is going all right, but embraces the Buddha's feet when something goes wrong. When you are sick, you ask me to save you. And when you don't have any sickness, you don't think about it. If you don't have any afflictions, then you won't get sick. Nirvana is just the absence of afflictions. It's tranquil, perfect, still, ultimate, and devoid of afflictions. Some people hear others tell them not to have afflictions and it scares them. And it scares them. They say, I can't separate from my afflictions. I thrive on my afflictions. Then I get mad. I don't have to eat, but I get full. Then go ahead, eat temple every day, eat afflictions. Sutra. When they hear that the past is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the future is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the present is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that entering every combat is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. Commentary. When they hear that the past is inconceivable, that all the time barriers of the past are inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the future is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. When they hear that the present is inconceivable, their minds are not afraid. 
their minds up, their minds don't retreat when they hear that entering every compound is inconceivable. Their minds are not afraid when they hear about entering all compounds, cultivating throughout all great compounds, no matter how long they are staying in those compounds and taking across all living beings everywhere. They are not daunted. They enter all compass to teach and transform living beings. They do not become frightened or lose heart. That is inconceivable also. Sutra, why not these bodhisattvas residing in the places of Buddhas have thoroughly solid faith? They know that the Buddha's wisdom is boundless and inexhaustible. In each and every one of the limitless worlds of the ten directions, there are limitless Buddhas who have already attained, are now attaining, and will attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. They have already come into the world and now coming into the world, or will come into the world. They have already entered Nirvana, are now entering Nirvana, or will enter Nirvana. The wisdom of these Buddhas does not increase, does not decrease, is not produced, is not destroyed, does not progress, does not retreat, is not near, is not far, is without knowing and without rejecting. These Bodhisattvas enter into the Buddha's wisdom and accomplish about this inexhaustible belief. After they attain this belief, their minds do not retreat. Their minds do not become scattered or confused. They are indestructible and undefined. They always have a foundation. They are caught with sages and dwell in the household of the first come ones. Commentary When Bodhisattvas hear of these inconceivable states, they are not afraid. Instead, it causes their resolve for body to increase and grow, their bravery and fearlessness to grow and also causes them to become even more vigorous. Why is it that the Bodhisattvas do not become afraid? Why not? These Bodhisattvas who cultivate the ten inexhaustible treasuries and who are residing in the places of Buddhas have thoroughly solid faith from beginning this compass past and up until the time of Shaky Omni Buddha's ocean like Avatamsaka assembly. These Bodhisattvas have maintained strong, secure, and adamantine faith of the Bodhi Way. They know that the Buddha's wisdom is boundless and inexhaustible. They have profound faith in the Buddha Dharma. They know and understand that the Buddha's wisdom has no boundary, no limit, and that it does not come to an end. The Buddha's wisdom is such that they could never finish describing it even if you talked to the ends of the bounds of future time. In each and every one of the limitless worlds of the ten directions, not only in the Saha world but all the way up through the limitless worlds in the ten directions, there are limitless Buddhas. Each world has a Buddha who comes to be born there. And because worlds are limitless, Buddhas are also limitless. One doesn't know how many there are. The num their number is in un uncountable. You can also say that however many living beings there are in all the worlds in the ten directions, there are that many Buddhas because each living being is a future Buddha. The Buddhas of the past are Buddhas who have already accomplished Buddhahood. The Buddhas of the present are Buddhas who are presently accomplishing Buddhahood. And the Buddhas of the future are all living beings who will in the future become Buddhas. These are Buddhas who have already attained and are now attaining and will attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the unsurpassed, proper, equal and right enlightenment. They have already come into the world, are now coming into the world, or will come into the world. They have already entered Nirvana. The Buddhas of the past have already entered Nirvana. They are now entering Nirvana. The Buddhas of the present are now entering Nirvana, or they will enter Nirvana. Nirvana is putting an end to affliction. When afflictions are extinguished, then one arrives at the other shore. This is Nirvana. We have vowed. 
Afflictions are endless. I vow to cut them off. Also, it says, we vow to cut off inexhaustible afflictions. Now I say, we don't have to cut them off. Why not? The Buddha Sutra say that afflictions are just body. So if you cut off afflictions, then you do away with body as well. Then what should you do? You should transform afflictions into body. But it is very difficult to transform them. Afflictions include hatred, in other words, your bad temper, your fire of ignorance. I have a verse that I would like to quote. Before, in the past, the flames of my rage flood higher than the heavens, consuming a forest of merit and virtue, thus I now reap a bitter retribution. The fire of my hatred was so great it burned through the heaven of the thirty-three. Fire burns up the first dhyana, water submerges, submerges the second dhyana, and wind tears down the third dhyana. If there was merit and virtue at all in my cultivation, I burned it all up. For this reason, I now endure the retribution of suffering. So, I only eat once a day and cause all of you young people with wealth and good position to join me in enduring this suffering. That I should undergo it is appropriate. That you should do it is unjustified and you have chosen to do it voluntarily. In my case, my huge temper burned up an entire forest of merit and virtue. So you shouldn't imitate your teacher's temper. If you say, oh, my teacher's temper is really great and I want to study this with him. If you do this in the future, you will fall into the house. You shouldn't study this. Even if you want to study this, I won't transmit it to you because I already know that this is wrong. I already know that the fire of my ignorance is taller than the heavens and so in this wealthy country with so much abundance and blessings, I have to undergo this kind of suffering. Only eating once a day is very difficult. If you don't believe it, you can look around everywhere in the world. You won't find groups of people as large as ours cultivating this practice. Maybe there will be a few people, but not a lot. You should all realize that not only is affliction harmful to other people, it is also harmful to oneself. Newton's second law of motion says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Your anger creates a negative reaction. Even if you haven't actually lost your temper, if you are displeased with another person, your bad vibrations, your telegram has already gone out to the other person. They receive these waves and they have a reaction to your anger before you even display it overtly they have already gotten upset what proof is there to this principle just look at people whether they have conditions with one another or not no matter how good you are to some people it doesn't seem to make a difference if you you just don't have affinities with them it's just like me no matter how good i am to people they still scold me this includes my intelligent disciples. I don't have any stupid disciples. None of them are as stupid as their teacher. If you don't have affinities with people, then you are always unhappy with them. Although you don't speak of it, the response to your vibrations will be negative. In other words, they will not feel affinities toward you. So as you study the Buddha Dharma, you shouldn't study my anger. If you enter Nirvana, there are none of these problems. You simply cross over to quiescence. But because you haven't crossed over yet, you have all these troubles. The wisdom of these Buddhas does not increase, does not decrease, is not produced, is not destroyed, does not increase, does not decrease. Is not produced, is not destroyed, does not progress, does not retreat. The Bodhisattvas cultivate constantly and unchangingly. You may not be aware of their progress, but there is also no retreating. The ordinary mind is the way. When the Buddhas cultivate, they embrace the three concepts of firmness, 
sincerity and constancy. They have firm faith, are extremely sincere, and are constantly steady in their practice. They do not retreat. The Buddha's wisdom is also not near and is not far. The Buddhas feel they are cultivating without cultivating and certifying without certifying. They cultivate as if nothing were going on. When they cultivate the six perfections and the ten thousand practices, they are just fulfilling their responsibility and practicing what they ought to cultivate. They don't feel they are close or far away from the Buddha Dharma. They are constantly immersed in cultivating the Buddha Dharma. Although they understand all dharmas and illumine all dharmas, they don't have the attachment of knowledge and do not renounce them. They are without knowing and without rejecting. They can renounce everything, but they don't feel that they've given up anything. How can they be this way? These bodhisattvas enter into the Buddha's wisdom and accomplish boundless, inexhaustible belief. Their faith has no end and no limits. After they attain this belief, this kind of boundless, inexhaustible faith, this strong and stable faith, their minds do not retreat. They have reached irreversibility, constantly holding the, to the middle way, embracing this unshakable faith. Their minds do not become scattered or confused. They are indestructible. No devil knowledge, views or speech of outside ways can break up their faith, and they are undefined. The minds of the bodhisattvas have no defiling attachment. To be without defilement is to be pure. They always have a foundation in wisdom. They accord with sages and dwell in the household of the first come ones. They reside in the Buddha's home, constantly dwelling within the Buddha Dharma, being permitted by it and practicing it. Sutra. They protect the seed nature of all Buddhas. They increase the faith and understanding of all Bodhisattvas. They comply with all such common good rules, and they give rise to the expedients of all Buddhas. This is called the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's treasury of belief. Commentary: The home of the Buddha is the way place, the Bodhi Manda. The Bodhi Manda is just the straight mind of people. The straight mind is the home of the first come one. The straight mind is Gold Mountain Monastery. The straight mind is the Bodhi Manda. When bodhisattvas dwell in the home of all first come ones, they must have some kind of work to do. What work? They protect the seed nature of all Buddhas. They keep the Buddha's lineage from being cut off, so that everyone can become accomplished in the Buddha way more quickly. They increase the faith and understanding of all bodhisattvas. Day by day, the bodhisattvas increase their faith and increase the power of their understanding. They comply with all first come ones good rules. We must cultivate all the good rules the Buddhas cultivate, and they give rise to the expedients of all Buddhas. Since you are caught with the good rules of all Buddhas, very naturally you can become a Buddha. After you become a Buddha, very naturally you can give rise to the expedient means of all Buddhas. This is called the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Treasury of Belief. All we have talked about is the treasury of belief that the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should cultivate. Sutra. When Bodhisattvas dwell in this treasury of belief, they can hear and uphold all the Buddha Dharma, speak it for living beings. And enable them to become enlightened. Commentary: When bodhisattvas dwell in this treasury of belief, bodhisattvas always cultivate the treasury of belief. Why is that? Faith is the source of the way, the mother of merit and virtue. It nourishes all good dharmas. If you have faith, you can cultivate the Buddha Dharma. So it says they can hear and uphold all the Buddha Dharma. It is important to have faith when you listen to the Buddha Dharma. If you don't have faith, it's impossible to listen to the Sutra lecture. So have belief fulfills the 
requirement of faith listening fulfills the requirement of hearing and upholding fulfills the requirement of receiving and maintaining to take what you hear and put it into actual practice once you've heard it you must speak it for living beings and enable them to become enlightened you must vastly proclaim it for all living beings it's not enough to just listen yourself you want to cause all living beings to hear the drama and become enlightened.